it's a lens through that you could view all of society through. And I think that is what accounts for his influence. So his ideas took off in France, maybe in the early eighties or, or seventies, he was really popular, a sort of public, a celebrity public intellectual, but in America and in North America, I would say he still gets cited thousands and thousands of times each year. Marx was right about the material base of society, but the culture, that's, there's a lot of power in the culture. In fact, that might be where the real power resides, is in the cultures, in the ideas. And so the neo-Marxists are shifting away from an, a purely economic and material analysis of who has the money, who has the land. Well, I've been canceled a couple of times miniaturely. I had Rolling Stone did an article on me because they wanted to, because I got ratioed badly because some of my tweets hit left-wing political Twitter and, and whatnot. And I've had some of that happen. And I'm sure that there'll be more coming. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm good. I know it doesn't look like afternoon here because it's not. <laughs> oh. It's evening. What time is it there? Oh. Uh, it's okay. about quarter to nine p.m. Oh, wow. Yep. Where I am, it is one forty-five. One forty-five. How could it be that different? It's. It just doesn't seem like the world's that big. But you know what? It is. It's that big. So let's yeah. talk about. Let's review what we talked about last time, because you're <clears> going <throat> to give me some insight that I'm going to just be blown away by. I hope so. Okay. I will try. Okay. okay. So last time we did a rather long and complicated romp, romp through Derrida and. All romps through Derrida are long and complicated because Derrida is a long and complicated philosopher who has a penchant for uh, a lack of clarity and for verbosity. And so for that reason, translation, Derrida likes to talk a lot and he likes to use very, very complicated jargon and he doesn't like to explain himself. So I was trying to think about about that explanation, and I was like, you know, I think a lot of people hearing that are going to get lost just because there's so much going on. So I tried to think of a way that I could simplify it by way of a recap to help us out. So here's, here's my, my simplified recap. Basically, what Derrida does is this. Because our, our three kind of big areas that we're going to look at in postmodernism is going to be uh, Derrida, Foucault, and Baudrillard. Those are, our th our, those are the big three that people... And then there's Gucciari, and there's Deleuze, and there's some others. But those three names keep popping up. And so Derrida is doing something in the language. And I tried to figure out, well, what's, how, do you, how do you explain it simply? So I think I have an idea. If we want to take the old idea as being that words refer to things might be the simplest way to say it. Words point at objects. Phone. Book. Words point at the world. Derrida is going to say, no, 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 no. Words don't point at the world. Something else is going on. There is no inherent substantive essential connection between words and objects. There's that's that's a mistake. <clears throat> and he says, you know, you could look at, for example, um, other languages might be a good one. So I could say desk in English and bureau in French. And he says, look, two different words connected that would be connected to the same object. So he goes, look, there's no connection between words and objects. Words are not connected to the world. That's a mistake. He says, look, here's what's happening. The words are all defining each other in kind of an endless swirl. If you look up in the dictionary for the word, word desk, you don't find a desk. You don't find a picture of a desk. You don't find a little miniature desk. You find a bunch of words. And why is that? Because the words define each other. See? And he says the same thing happens with objects. The objects define each other. How do you know what a tree is? Well, because it's not a bush and it's not a shrub and it's not a flower and it's not an animal, right? A tree is defined by its place in the ecosystem, by its place in the world, by how it relates. Now, this is a can. 
Why? Because it's not a bottle and it's not a cup and it's not a bucket and it's not a plate. Things are defined by their relationship to other things, by their similarities and differences to other things. That's it. So then we could take an example of, for, for say, a bucket. Suppose I have a bucket on a construction site. It's a bucket. We use the word bucket to describe it. Why is it a bucket? Well, because it's not the hammer and it's not the truck and it's not the dirt and it's not <clears throat> a pail. It's a bucket. Okay. So I turn the bucket over and sit on it and I say, pull up a chair. And we're all going to use the buckets as chairs. Well, how did the bucket become a chair? Those are different words. And aren't buckets and chairs different, different objects? What? What's going on here? And Derrida says, look, the bucket is defined by what? Its place in the system. And our interpretation of its place in the system. In the same way, words are defined by other words in the way that we interpret them. And so Derrida says, there is no inherent definition of a bucket. All you have is context and interpretation. That's that makes it. sense. No, that's all there is to Derrida. And right. anyone can interpret anything in any way according to their own context. And there's no right. There's no wrong. There's just varying different interpretations. And those interpretations can be interpreted by other people. And there's just an endless discussion of the interpretations, an endless dialectic where people are debating. And that's it, says Derrida. We can never get an objective view of the world. We can never get an objective view or a final definitive answer as to what counts as a bucket and what doesn't. Derrida says, no, no, no. Look, you could never have that. All you have is context and interpretation. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the whole show. And how do words exist? Well, just by their, their place in the system, how they differ from other words. You'd know one word from another because they're pronounced differently and they're spelled differently. You know one, the difference between objects in the world because they look different or feel different or are a different size. So words, objects, things, <clears throat> it's all just a matter of these various little differences and it's all just a matter of the interpretation of those differences, what you do from a various, from your given perspective or not, or from a given perspective, whatever perspective you have is going to provide the perspective that you interpret from. And that's going to determine what you think the context is. So no one gets to decide what the, there is no absolute context. There is no absolute point of view. All there is, is local individual personal points of view. And there's many different contexts through which an object or a thing or an idea can be looked at. And that generates a number of different interpretations. And there is no final, absolute, objective, correct interpretations. It's just a battle of different interpretations as they are brought into the world by people who are trying to read the world or read a particular text. And that's all that's going on. That's Derrida. And what right. that does he, mm -hmm. is destabilize the definitions. And divides people because every nothing depends on me understanding your idea of what something is or what it means. It's your interpretation and you're not sharing it with anybody. It's it's a it's a it's a divisive and and there's no and because there's no ethic, there's no hierarchy of understanding. There's no, yeah, it's very, it's very devoid. It's really almost, it sounds narcissistic in a way. You know, I don't know if, if narcissism comes into it, but it, it is very much, it, it is what I say it is. And that's that. Well, that, that's pretty that's not playing fair. You might say if you were playing a game, right, then you're not following any, you don't want to follow the rules of the game. You have your own game. 
So you mm-hmm. play by yourself, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because there's no way, there's no absolute context and no absolute set of rules and no absolute frame of reference by which to adjudicate or decide between various interpretations. Right. And so what you're left with is either different cultures or different groups or different tribes will hold on to their own interpretations. And then people will argue about it for narrative supremacy, but there's no objective way to adjudicate to find out who's correct. Mm -hmm. And on Derrida's view, there may not be an actual final correct answer. Now, I'm glad you said the point about how there's no value system because later in Derrida's career, I think he realizes that. And so he tries to sneak something back in at the end Mm -hmm. by saying, well, there's one one thing that can't be deconstructed, and that's the concept of justice. He says that can't be deconstructed. Now, that opens Mm -hmm. up. I think Derrida to a charge of special pleading because he always talks about deconstructing binaries. Well, justice, injustice, that's a binary that's ripe for deconstruction. Mm -hmm. And who's to say what justice is? Different cultures have different definitions of justice. Justice from whose perspective? I mean, you could do, you could play the same game, but he, he does try at the end, sort of towards the end of his career to to try and bring something in. Why do you think he did that? Do you have any insight into why? What brought that I, up? I think, <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm going to quote Searle here mm-hmm. uh, just ahead of time. What I'm about to give is a diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Diagnosing why somebody made a mistake does not prove that they made a mistake. We still have to deal with the arguments, mm-hmm. right? So we can't just say, well, you have bad motives, therefore you're wrong. N- no, we have to say, here's what I think is motivating you, but I can still deal with the argument. So I just want to mm-hmm. make that point. Mm -hmm. Searle thinks that a lot of these guys are up to trying to engage in some sort of Nietzschean power grab Mm -hmm. that, that the rules of logic, objectivity, evidence, reason, rationality. If we play by those rules, the sort of leftist dogmatic social justice movement will fail and lose. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and so they've decided to come up with theories to try and get rid of that tradition because yes. it stands in their way. Mm-hmm. And that's so I think what happened is Derrida was kind of insinuating and and smuggling, trying to smuggle in uh, his his politics and his morality and all of that other stuff. I think it's latent in his early work. Mm-hmm. But if you take his early work just as it is. The problem is that there's no room for that because everything can be reinterpreted and there's no way to judge what's right or wrong. So he brings in justice at the end as kind of an attempt to have a sort of North Star that he can look at and say, well, this is where deconstruction is going. Deconstruction is always done in the name of justice. The problem is he has got no principled way to prevent someone from saying, well, let's deconstruct Derrida's notion of justice. Mm-hmm. It, it's the universal acid, right? So I think that's what's going on there. So shall we move on to Foucault? I like that. Sure. That was quick. That was quick. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I worked on that really hard. I was sat around and I thought about that. I'm impressed that you did that. That was good. So I thought we could talk about Foucault, Marxism, and power, those three things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the other, the other thing I wanted to talk about was or ask you was how how representative was Foucault's thought in France at the time? We could start with that one. How how representative yeah, was one. Foucault's thought in France at the time? Well, I don't think that Foucault Foucault was doing something new. Um, Derrida is continuing something that comes from Ferdinand de Saussure. He's just pushing Saussure a little further um, mm. and maybe a lot further. I don't want to say Derrida is not creative because he, he is. But um, as, as Cyril points out, Derrida, how does Cyril put it? He says, um, Derrida has a penchant for continually saying objectively false things. <laughs> 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 um I, I don't know if it's the quote is words to those effect, 
Um, Foucault is doing something different and new. Um, I don't think it was the dominant view in France when he showed up. I think he kind of came up with the view actually. Mm. And I think it, it began circulating in France and became a fad, but it quickly died out. Foucauldian thought is not dominant in France today. In fact, <clears throat> I mean, even getting close to the end of his life, Foucault began to hedge his bets on a lot of what he was saying. Um, right. I think, I think he was... His, his early work is much more potent, I would say. Uh, although that's, again, all of this is debatable. But I, I would say Foucault's thought really took off in America more than it took off in France. Um, American theorists picked, really picked up Foucault and ran with him. And that French, came into the English departments in the universities first? Um, yes, I think, I think I would say yes, but I would also say through anthropology, mm. um, and sociology as well <clears throat> made heavy right. use of Foucault. All of those disciplines were kind of bringing him in. Uh, I think critical legal theorists also were picking up on him at that time. And I think in education, maybe a little after that, but certainly still in the eighties and nineties, uh, critical pedagogists, critical education theorists were picking him up. Um, yeah. So he, and he, so Foucault was the most cited scholar in the humanities. Yes. And I think that is because he is, Foucault provides a new way to think about the world and an almost totally encompassing worldview to think about the world and to think about human dynamics and how people relate to each other. It's a lens through that you could view all of society through. And I think that is what accounts for his influence. So his ideas took off in France, maybe in the early eighties or, or seventies, he was really mm -hmm. popular, a sort of public, a celebrity public intellectual. Mm -hmm. But today in France, very few, if any people cite him, but in America and in North America, I would say there are still a large number of people who uh, who cite him and he still gets cited thousands and thousands of times each year. So he's retained a lot more influence in North America than he ever had in France. Maybe, maybe just a, another brief word about this real quick before we move on. Derrida and Foucault and a lot of these intellectuals were all circulating kind of in France at the same time. Mm -hmm. Prior to 1968, they were all at the Sorbonne. And and a number of them were hanging out with guys like Sartre. Um, Guy Debord had been influential in that time. Baudrillard, Gucciari, Deleuze. They're all there in France doing this kind of work, thinking about this kind of stuff, the focusing of the focus on power and language. And so these topics were all being thought about at that time, which is why all these guys emerge. It's just that in France... They're for one, they were all able to ex access the stuff instantly because it was written in French and they all mm -hmm. are native speakers. And so they were able to, I think, digest it, get through it and realize it didn't work. Whereas in America, it kind of trickled out of France bit by bit by bit. Elizabeth and St. Pierre in, a, in an article talks about how they were always waiting for the next translation uh, so they could get more. And so what would end mm -hmm. up happening is it is it mm -hmm. kind of creates a thirst for more of it. And I think that's kind of that's part of the reason why it took off in America. Hmm, I see. Yeah, well, he was a very smart man. Oh, I mean, Foucault was intelligent. Mm -hmm. I think he's wrong, but he was intelligent. Like, there's no doubting that. He knew what he was doing. So he grew up in France, and he was a professor in France. Did he ever come to America? Yes, he, he did on a number of occasions. He actually knew John. He Sorrell didn't work here, was, though. He didn't work in America. I'm not sure if he worked here or not. I think he had some visiting fellowships and visiting professorships. Mm. I know he lectured several times here. Yeah. Um, 
a number of lectures, I believe, I think, uh, I want to say at UC Berkeley and at Columbia as well. I'm not sure. I, I can't remember just off the top of my head. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, he, he did. He came. Uh, he actually knew John Searle because I believe Searle is uh, fluent in French. And they had a conversation and uh, Searle asks them and says, you guys write, you and Darren, you write, it's incomprehensible. Why do you write that way? And uh, Foucault is reported to have responded that, well, in order to succeed in France, you have to have 10% that's incomprehensible. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody thinks it's smart. You got to have at least 10% of that. And okay. Um, he also, Foucault is known to have said that Derrida was a, a, a terrorist, terrorist obscurante. In other words, that he was an obscurantist and terrorist in his in his work because yeah. it was so much of it was incomprehensible. Whereas mm -hmm. Foucault was making a much more straightforward set of claims about knowledge, truth, and power. And so, so in terms yeah. of Marxism and power, which, which came first in his theories and how did that get started? So critical theory <clears throat> had always been concerned with power in our, in our last uh, little dialogue, we read um, from Alison Bailey uh a bit where she said critical thinking is concerned with things like rationality, logic, reason, getting things right, making sure that our knowledge obtaining resources or our knowledge obtaining methods or a way of learning about the world, our epistemology mm -hmm. is up to snuff. That's what we want to do in critical thinking, where she says the critical pedagogy, which comes from the critical theory tradition of the neo-Marxist Frankfurt school, that sort of, uh, the tradition of critical theory, which the neo-Marxists of the Frankfurt School came up with. In, in that tradition, the ideas, questions, statements, and claims of students are treated as expressions of power. So with that in mind, I think that the thing that we need to take to kind of rewind is rewind and go back to it, visit Marxism and its relationship to power just a little bit okay. so that we can set the table. Marxism kind of viewed power as a weight that was pushing down on you. It's an oppressive pushing down, holding down, pinning down like a weight, like a ball and chain or a set of handcuffs. You might want to think of it that way. Power is a thing that wraps you up and holds you. It prevents you. It ties you up. It tangles you up. It pushes against you. It pulls back. Uh, when you want to move one way, it forces you in another. That's how they viewed power. Mm. It's, it's coming down from above, from powerful people who have a higher status and a higher position and a higher place in the hierarchy. And it's coming down on you. That's the Marxist idea. And rather than get into a huge number of fights, and debates over base and superstructure and all the other stuff, because we could go for hours talking about Marxism. I'll simply say the Marxists were not entirely blameless. And I think that the differences between the Marxists and the postmodernists is sometimes oversold, particularly the neo-Marxists. And I'm just going to leave that there. But their view of power was it was pushing down on you from above and Critical theory in large part wanted to look at the idea of power and see how it oppresses people, how it's wielded, how it gets hidden. They wanted to find out where power dynamics are at play and how those warp society or change society or alter society, how who benefits from it, whose interests are served, what different agendas are being implemented, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the Marxist idea. Did he come? Was he a wealthy person? Oh, uh, he was a member of the educated class. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that he himself was wealthy. He had benefactors. He was. A, he was a. He was a loner, though, was he not? Yeah, I think so. I think. Um, I don't know off the top of my head a whole pile about Marx's life, but I do know that. In, in large part, a lot of people were kind of, he had a lot of help from a lot of different people to be able to do what he did. And he had benefactors. He had people who would help him get published in certain places. So 
it it isn't like Marx was just a solitary figure just writing in his room and his writings became famous. He had and he was in Germany. Was he in Germany then? Because he's a German. I believe so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, He may he may have moved around a little bit, but yeah, he was he was in the German tradition of of German idealism. Stephen Hicks uh, writes about him quite a bit and has a lot more to say about him. And so I would encourage people to look at Stephen Hicks. Yeah, I'm um, going to interview Stephen Hicks in uh, in June. Oh, yes. so I'll talk. I'll talk to him about that then. Yeah, he would be able to do a, a much better job than I would of of discussing Marx's life and Marx's place in sort of the German idealist tradition. Mm-hmm. But I want to just pin down that one little notion of power. <clears throat> and mm-hmm. Marx was dealing with the material situation where factories are, who has access to capital, who owns the land. And he was looking at that and saying, that's ultimately where power is based. Whoever controls the resources and the money has the power. That was Mm -hmm. Marx's economic idea. And so the Marxists generally looked at that. The Frankfurt School came along and said, well, Marx was right about the material base of society, but the culture, that's there's a lot of power in the culture. In fact, that might be where the real power resides, is in the cultures, in the ideas. Um, which ideologies have power? Is it conservatism? Is it progressivism? Which uh, moral viewpoints have power? Is it Christianity? Is it atheism? That's where the real power is. And so the neo-Marxists are shifting away from an, a purely economic and material analysis of has well, they, the money, they found out the that didn't work, right? They found out that the economic idea didn't work, that capitalism was a was successful. Mm-hmm. So they had to find another way in. Yeah. And so they went from economics to culture. Yes. And also yeah. the failure of, of the Soviets when they when they tried to take over societies and, and then they would lose. And so part of this comes from Gramsci's idea of cultural hege- hegemony. Um, Gramsci's idea was, look, you can take over the material stuff but if your ideas aren't popular in the culture, they'll just throw you out of power, right? You can seize whatever you want, but the people aren't going to accept it if they don't agree with you. So you need to have cultural power. So that's the move from, from the material to the cultural. <clears throat> so that move has happened. Critical theory is already working there. We have the ideas of language of Derrida already circulating. That's the, the post-structuralism. And mm-hmm. so this whole kind of movement, this turn towards language has already occurred. Gottlob Frege has already written his work. Uh, the philosophy of language is well on its way. We have such people as Bertrand Russell. We have the logical positivists in Germany with Rudolf Carnap. All of these people are turning towards language. Okay. Culture, language, ideas kind of away from the, you know, who controls the money and the power. Now it's like, okay, who controls the ideas? Mm-hmm. So we've, we've turned into the social, political, cultural, and linguistic realm, and that's where Foucault is going to pop up. Okay, that's right where he's going to step in. And he's going to say something new. Okay. Okay. Foucault, there's an old saying, uh, France, I think it comes, is first expressed by Francis Bacon, which is knowledge is power. And what he meant by it is the person who has knowledge of how the world works can do more in the world. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple idea, right? Foucault was going to say knowledge is power, but he's going to do something different with it. When Bacon said it, what Bacon meant is knowledge provides you the ability to, to do things in the world, to affect change and to create Mm -hmm. the world that you'd like. Mm-hmm. Foucault has a very different meaning and it's a little bit heady and it's a little bit obscure but I think with a little bit of work we can nail it down Okay. Foucault's basic insight is to say that knowledge and power are two features of the same object okay whereas Francis Bacon was saying that knowledge and power, that knowledge helps one to exercise power or perhaps to gain power. Foucault was going to say that knowledge and power can't be separated at all. It's, it's 
there are two aspects, two features, two properties belonging to a single object or thing. So So it's not that knowledge is power? Is it knowledge is power? Or no? Well, when Bacon when Bacon said that knowledge is power, that was a bit of an aphorism. For Mm. knowledge is the thing that helps you to get power and control things. Yeah. Where knowledge or knowledge causes power, knowledge helps you exercise power. Um when or what some people say money is power. Mm -hmm. Well, Money isn't the money helps you get power. That's the idea that the bacon has. Foucault was saying, no, no, no. Knowledge quite literally is power, and those two things can't actually be separated. They're literally part of the same object. He's gonna fuse them together. So it's not that if you have knowledge, you can exercise power. Foucault doesn't think that. Foucault thinks these two things are together. They can't be separated. It would be quite literally impossible for somebody to separate them, even if they wanted to. And so for that reason, I just want to pull something up here. So there was no goodness anymore then, because knowledge could be good, but not with Foucault. I think it's not so much that he's going to say there can't be goodness I don't think that he gets quite to there. Um, it's that he's. It's that if you take him seriously and you accept his 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 in, his injunction, his idea that power, knowledge, and two features is the same object, mm-hmm. you just wind up in a nihilistic position for reasons that I'll explain. So yes, he's going to obliterate the concept of good and evil. He's gonna he's gonna have a a big problem with that that he can't get out of, and we're gonna well, see if why. if knowledge is power. What's power? Power is winners, winners and losers. This is right. The, well, Oppressors and oppressed. Yes. Mm, is that where that comes from? No. He's, because well, no. Sort of. <laughs> so why don't we? It's it's tricky. So Foucault says this. My objective for more than twenty five years has been to sketch out a history of the different ways in which our culture that humans develop knowledge about themselves. Economics, biology, psychiatry, medicine penology, which is of the penal system. The main point is not to accept this knowledge at face value, but to analyze these so-called sciences as a very, as very specific truth games related to spe- specific techniques that human beings use to understand themselves. Truth games. That's right. I see. So what's truth then? In that idea. So here's Foucault on truth. Truth is to be understood as a system of ordered procedures for the production, regulation, distribution, circulation, and operation of statements. Truth, quote unquote, is linked in a circular relation with systems of power which produce and sustain it. And to the effects of power which it induces and which extend it, a regime of truth. So here's what he's saying. Our idea of truth is that truth is a, is a relation, is a correspondence relation. If a, sta- if a statement or a sentence uh, accurately states what the world is, then it's true. We want what the sentence that I say or the proposition that I assert to match the world. So, for example, I say the sentence, Tammy has earbuds in. That's a proposition. That's a sentence that expresses the proposition that Tammy has earbuds in. Well, is it true? Well, we go into the world and we look and we see earbuds in Tammy's ears. It's true. True. It's true because it corresponds to the world. That's truth. Foucault is going to say, no, no, no. That's not truth. That's not how truth works. That's a naive view. Foucault's going to say, look, in the first century, it was true that the sun rotated around the earth. That's what everyone believed. It, it was true that bloodletting was an effective form of medicine. It was true that Zeus lived on the top of Mount Olympus. Everybody knew that. So he says, look, what, what 
what you believe is true isn't about correspondence to the world. Truth is a social status that is, in, that is put on to particular sentences, ideas, con concepts, propositions, etc. It's a label that we slap on things that gives them an elevated status. So when we read his definition, and we're going to read his definition again so that everyone can get clear, notice something about this definition. It doesn't mention corresponding to the world. Here's his definition. Truth is to be understood as a system of ordered procedures for the production, regulation, distribution, circulation, and operation of statements. Truth is linked in a circular relation with systems of power which produce and sustain it, and to effects of power which it induces and which extend it. A regime of truth. It's not about getting sentences and statements and propositions which are in accordance with reality or fact. And it's not trying to get statements that correspond with the world. It's just a system of ordered procedures for producing statements. Think about that for a second. What he's saying is each society has its own social procedure for deciding what it's going to give that label truth to. And that's what makes something true. And how do those people get to, get to be in a position where they decide what's true? Well, that's power. There are certain people who have the power to do the regulating and circulating and the production of statements that are true. Certain people have the power to decide what society sees as true. There are certain people who have the power to label things as true, says Foucault. And so it's power that creates truth. People use power to label things as true, but he says it's a circular relation. And what does he mean by that? Well, if I have the power to decide what's true, I can say this is true and this is true and this is true and this is true in a way which gives me even more power. So, so to go use an example from, say, the second century, a religious group, a Muslim group, a Jewish group, a Christian group, might find themselves to be the most influential group in a society. And so they might be the ones who get to decide what that society believes is true. Well, they might decide that society should believe things which give, that, which give them more power. The priestly class might decide that society should believe that the priestly class is infallible. Well, that might give the priestly class more power. And what are they going to do with that power? They're going to make more decisions about what can be believed and what can't be believed. And once you can control what people can believe or what they think is true, well, guess what? That gives you a whole lot more power. See that? Mm -hmm. Whoever gets, if you get to decide what is true, if you can control the discourse, so to speak, if you can decide which elements of the discourse, which elements of the society-wide conversation are valid or invalid, are legitimate or illegitimate, are right or wrong, are true or false, you have a huge amount of power. And you can use that power to warp the discourse, to warp the conversation, to warp the ideas, to give yourself even more power. And that is what Foucault was doing. That's Foucault's idea. Foucault believes that hiding behind our concept of truth isn't logic, reason, rationality. What Foucault thinks is that what is hiding behind our notions of truth is actually power. And that truth is a thing that is used by the powerful people to legitimize and validate their power. That's what he thinks. That's why he says truth and power in a circular relationship. One reinforces so, the other and they can't be pulled apart. So if people who, if the people who are in control 
have the power, then they're going to decide what's true based on their own self-interest. That's correct. Right. So, Mm -hmm. and then the people who don't have power, Mm -hmm. you know, so they're, they're not going to have any power. So then they're going to be out of luck Mm -hmm. and pitied, pitied because they're not in power. So they don't have the, uh, means to better themselves or prosper. That's right. He's going to say, yeah, the people who have the power can act in their own self-interest to decide what is true so that everyone believes them, which gives them even more power. And the people who don't have power are going to be stuck at the bottom with no way out. They're just yeah. going to be oppressed. Now, yeah, Foucault, that's brutal. <laughs> yeah, but he's going to add a little wrinkle to this. And Mm -hmm. what he's going to say is that power isn't a purely top-down relationship. Because Foucault notices that throughout history, sometimes those oppressed people overthrow Mm. the ruling power. Well, how does that happen? So what he says is, look, power isn't an object that can be held by one person. It's more like a grid or a field of power. It's, it's, It's not like a series of weights. It's more like an electrical grid or... um or radio waves, or a field of Bluetooth, or Wi-Fi. Anyone who can connect to it in the right way can wield it. So, for example, you could have, maybe, uh, you have more money than me, and you have more social status than me, and whatever else, but suppose I'm very, very clever, and I figure out how to, I, I persuade the crowd to agree with me. Well, in that case... I've used persuasion and influence. And Foucault says, that's also a form of power because that's a part of the discourse. That's a part of the conversation. So if I can be persuasive, I can wield power too. It's not just brute force and it's not just top down. Now, the person at the top is going to be able to say, maybe hold up some credentials and hold up some Uh, hold up their degrees and their certifications, and that will uh, give them a place of prominence, and that can be a form of power. But if I come along, and I'm very clever with my words, and I can be persuasive, that's me exercising a form of power. But in both cases, what's happening is not a battle of rationality and logic and reason. It's a battle of power. It's a power struggle. And the ability to win the power struggle is going to be a product of who is better at understanding and wielding the elements of the discourse, which are powerful. Who is the person who's best able to use language and the conceptual uh, legitimization structures of that society in order to get what they want. So maybe you have more degrees, but maybe I'm better at quoting experts And because I'm really good at quoting experts, I get a lot of validity within the conversation. And so these, this, this, the whole idea is that, that knowledge and power are intimately connected, completely inseparable. Quoting experts. If somebody is quoting experts and claiming to be someone who you should listen to, that's also a sign of narcissism. Because they're, well, they're, uh, they're, it's nothing that they have done. They've taken, they've taken, they're um, acting as if they are part of something that they haven't spent the time and the energy to, to, to make it, uh, to make the movement and the understanding more comprehensive or right. So they're just right. So they're taking ideas and concepts, using them, using them opinions. So those would be opinions in a way. No, it's well, I I think, I think there's something to that. I think if, if you're just quoting somebody for the sake of quoting them so that you can Use their prestige and clout as a shield for your views. Yes. Mm -hmm. I do think there is a place. 
I do think there is a place for quoting people as long as you fully understood what that person is working on and as long as the right. quote is in context. But yes, I think the cynical sort of quoting somebody so you can say, well, as and pick a really famous, I don't know, Aquinas or somebody or Einstein, as Albert Einstein says, and everyone goes, ooh, it's Einstein. We better listen to Einstein. I'm just using Einstein as a shield for my bad views. And I'm, I'm, I'm helping myself to his prestige and his clout and his fame for my own ends. I do think right. that is a form of narcissism. I agree with that. Yeah. Is there anything like that in this form of philosophy? Well, there might be. Let's let's investigate another aspect of it. Maybe maybe there is. Um, what happens to this view with Foucault? What ends up happening is he ends up with the view that power is a part of discourses, or more accurately, that discourses are inextricably linked to power. What's a discourse? Discourse is the way things are talked about, discussed, understood, debated, etc. So, for example, there might be in the United States, a discourse around the First Amendment, which is going to explain, and that discourse is going to include various ideas about what the First Amendment means, how it should be interpreted, how it's been applied in the past, how it should be applied in the future, landmark cases, et cetera, et cetera. And what Foucault is going to say is the ideas which get elevated and which get lowered, the ideas which are empowered and disempowered, the, the the ideas which are validated or delegitimized, all of that occurs within the discourse around the First Amendment, it's all the conversations, all the legal textbooks, all the legal cases, everything from tweets about the law to the arguments at the Supreme Court is all part of the discourse, broadly construed. And Foucault is going to say all of the power lies within and is created by those discourses. Okay. Um, and so um, so knowledge and truth are created um, with power via language, you might say. There's another sense you could say with language via power, but we'll we'll go with 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 power via language. Language and discourse is the vehicle through which power is exercised. Now, on that view, it kind of erodes the difference between narcissism and and humility, or narcissism and not being a narcissist. Why? Because everyone on that view is just trying to exercise power. Everyone is just exercising power. If I'm, if you say the First Amendment should be applied in such and so a way, and I disagree with you, you and I are just engaged in a power struggle, right? Because what Foucault is going to say is, if you try to say who's true, what's what's true, Foucault is going to say true truth. What's truth? Truth is a product of the social processes, and the social processes are, of course, a product of who has power, and self-interest and bias and all the rest of it. So there is no objective standard of truth. There are just socially constructed standards of truth that are constructed with via power. So there is no objective standard of truth. The, the correspondence relation between um, our truth claims in the world has been broken by Foucault. And so he says, truth is a purely social object. It's a socially constructed object. It's a label that we put to validate and legitimize certain claims over and above other claims, but it's not objectively related to the world. Now, there's a problem here, which we'll get into in a minute. But do you see how his view works? It's impossible to call, it's almost impossible to deal with narcissism because on this view, almost everyone's a narcissist because everyone is just trying to get power. The person who quotes Einstein to get clout and prestige and the person who quotes Einstein because of his rigorous work are both just using Einstein in different ways to try and get power. So it's almost impossible. So in one sense, it's impossible to pick out a narcissist on a Foucaultian view. On the other hand, it really does empower the narcissists, doesn't it? It seems to, yeah. Now, it does. we should say something... Um, 
because I've avoided it up to this point. And I've tried, what I try to do is make the view sound as plausible as I can so that people yeah. can understand it and say, you know what? I could, I could see why people believe that because I have this idea that if, if you can't see why somebody would believe of you, then you haven't understood it. But I would note something about both Derrida and Foucault. So Derrida has this view that language is, is, not, is not objective. There's no objective point of reference. There's no absolutely correct interpretations. And yet, Derrida always complained about people misinterpreting him. Interesting. Derrida wrote large volumes of books, which he claimed adequately explained correctly how language functions. And his explanation of how language functions is that it can always be reinterpreted and misinterpreted and that there's no objective, clearly correct uh, meaning to a text. Hey, Derrida, if there's no objectively correct meaning to a text, then nobody can misinterpret you because there's no objectively correct way to interpret you. But it really seems like Derrida thinks there's an objectively correct way to interpret him and he gets really mad if you don't get it right. <laughs> he really appears to be cutting off the branch that he's sitting on. That's like Another, nihilists. Nihilists that don't believe in anything, but they get together and uh, dance together and jump and hit and jump in a mosh pit with one another to the beat of the music of their music. You know, I mean, everybody, <laughs> everybody's got to the place that they, yeah, they thrive. Yeah, Dar or they think Dar they thrive. That's right. So it, it belies the idea that on the one hand, they're claiming there is no truth, but they're claiming it really is true that there is no truth. <laughs> right. Yeah. Whoops. Mm -hmm. I, he's, he's got a very meaningful book, which tells us that meaning is unstable. There's a correct interpretation of his book, which says there's no absolute correct interpretations. Oh, I'm sorry, Derda. It really seems, it really seems like he actually is. And, uh, William Lane Craig and, and JP Moreland point this out in, uh, Foundations for a Christian Worldview. They say, on the one hand, they gesture towards the you know there is no truth, there is no objectively right way the world is, there are no objective moral standards. But in all of their books, they seem to be giving making claims about how things are really true. The same is true with Foucault. Foucault says, "Look, knowledge is just constructed, and there is no okay." Is is that true, Foucault? And if all of this is just people trying to get power, does that mean that you're just trying to get power, Foucault? Or are you somehow exempt? So somebody actually asked him this, and uh, and let me just see if I can get the the exact date for it. Uh, this is Foucault replies to questions from the audience at Berkeley's history department in 1983. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Foucault is asked about this, and someone says, look, man, given the fact that you don't try and refute theories, you claim not to be a structuralist, nor do you believe in a totality, why should we believe you? Right? He said, look, you don't try to refute anybody else's theories. You don't have a structuralist theory of your own. You don't believe in an absolute total thing that can be known. Right? That's his point. Why should we believe you? And Foucault responds by saying, there is no reason. And yet he still seems to be writing all this stuff like he really believes it, doesn't. So Foucault has, has, has claimed to write to us um, a book about how things really are, which says that there is no such thing as objective truth. It really is true that there is no truth? I'm sorry, Foucault, but you're cutting off the branch that you're sitting on. Again, you're undercutting yourself. These views are always self-refuting. And what you get is the impression that what these guys are saying is true of everyone else except for them. All of your books can be interpreted endlessly. My book, says Derrida, well, you can't interpret me endlessly. I, I didn't mean that. He gets quite mad at Searle and saying, how many times do I have to state this? That's not what I meant. And it's kind of like, but Derrida... <laughs> If everything can be reinterpreted, it doesn't matter what you mean, right? After all, mm -hmm. meaning is in the interpretation, not in what you actually wrote. Isn't that right, Derda? I'm sorry. When Foucault, you know, Foucault says, truth is just a product, uh, a, a system of ordered procedures for circulating and producing statements. Is that true? 
Is that actually the way the world is? Because he says that he says that we can check to see if I'm correct. Well, how? Why don't we just produce a number and circulate a number of statements that say you're an idiot? And those would be true on your own theory, right? If we could get enough powerful people together to circulate the statements that Foucault is an idiot, we could defeat his theories. And he would have to just accept that because he'd have to say, well, yeah, truth is just a series of ordered statements. You see the point? He, the, he undermines the power of his own theories, playfully laughs off the result, and then just keeps going. And you really get the impression that all of this is being done in the service of something else. And I think the thing that they're in the service of is the attempts to tear down our rationalistic Western tradition. That's what I think is going on here. And so you end up with Foucault saying the discourses are the things that determine all of the power relations and all of the discussion that's going on in the discourse is really about power. Power is at the root of everything. All of your truth claims are really about power and your, your, your power is what is used to construct the truth claims which are validated and legitimized and therefore are followed and obeyed and therefore grant power. All of that, Foucault says, is what's going on. And, and you, get, you get the distinct impression that if he played by the rules of reason, rationality, and logic, that his, he would lose. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of with Searle here that a lot of this stuff has been picked up in the way that it's been picked up and it's being used in the way that it's being used by social theorists precisely because they know that if they play by the rules of reason, rationality, logic, and truth, that they're going to lose. So they have to yeah, destroy well, they've those lost things. before, right? They've lost before. And then they bring it back. They lost through economics. And now they've come back. And they... But eventually they came to uh, that it became all about race. Mm -hmm. Yes. All I about very, all, all about gender. Mm -hmm. All about these very, very basic uh, facts of being human. Uh, the, the broad differences, you know, the man and woman. These are things that no one can misunderstand, right? Because they're so they're so basic. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, how old is a child when he learns the difference between a girl and a boy? Right. Right. Yeah. That's I don't know correct. how old they are, but it's pretty early yeah. on. So you don't mm -hmm. have to be very aware to be aware of these issues that are polarizing society. Mm -hmm. And that means that, that everyone in society can be a part of that and understand it and be uh, subject to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I so, think that's right. You know, it was yeah. economics. That was complicated. Com that was com language. That's pretty complicated. Yep. And and they so what I, I this is a, a nice summary is from cynical theories that's James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose's book and he say um, the new theories arose would, now we because we talked about Foucault and Derrida and that's back in the eighties now you're talking yeah. about the race critical race theory the queer theory the LGBTQ stuff post colonial theory yeah. right all that stuff yeah. And they say this about yeah. that. They say new theories arose, which primarily looked at race, gender, and sexuality, and were explicitly critical, goal-oriented, goal and moralistic. They retained, however, the core postmodern ideas that knowledge is a construct of power, that the categories into which we organize people and phenomena were falsely contrived in the service of that power, that language is inherently dangerous and unreliable, that the knowledge, claims, and values of all cultures are equally valid and intelligible only on their own terms, and that collective experience trumps individuality and universality. They focused on cultural power, 
regarding it is objectively true that power and privilege are insidious corrupting forces which work to perpetuate themselves in mysterious ways they explicitly stated that they were doing this with the purpose of remaking society according to their moral vision all while citing the original postmodern theorists so mm -hmm. yep they did that was the move so they went that's um the movement in we went remember we went from economics to culture now mm -hmm. they're adding the identity, an identity element to the cultural analysis. So now it's man mm -hmm. and woman, black and white, indigenous or not indigenous, wealth, uh, wh whatever you want to do, whatever identities are available, they're going to pick at and they're going to say. Mother nature, mother nature would be another one. Yeah. N natural versus unnatural. Right. So you can yeah. see that a lot in the trans discourse where you say. They say there's no natural correct way that someone should be. You, there's, you don't, if, if someone is born with a certain set of genitals, according to a certain type of, uh, according to whether they're male or female, that's not natural and correct and a right way to be. That's just, that just happens to be the way that they are. And we can change that in any way that we like. We can, so there is no, there is no, what we would call natural teleology. There's no purposes, objective purposes for anything. There are no objective essences for everything. So if we can take now, because we're, we're, we're probably, we're getting on a little bit, and um, I want to be cognizant of your time, but I, wanna, I really want to make mm -hmm. this observation. Derda is doing a certain thing with language which destabilizes it and disconnects it from objects, right? Yeah. Foucault is doing the same thing with truth. And mm -hmm. when you disconnect truth and language from the world, what you end up with is ideas, concepts, viewpoints, which are untethered to reality. And when it's not tethered to reality, reason, logic, and evidence no longer hold sway. What holds sway is things like prestige, clout, influence, charisma. Those are the things that really start to matter because it's not connected yeah, to the geez, world. Yeah, geez, charisma? Really? Yeah. Wow, you know? Whoever can you know, persuade what, what, what makes a psychopath? Somebody who uh, postures, mm -hmm. postures competence. Mm -hmm. They're usually uh, pe people who are um, very self-assured. Mm -hmm. So they appear to be solid on their feet, you know, and, yep. and in, uh, in control mm -hmm. of, of things. Yes. And young, naive people can be tricked by those things because yes. they don't look any deeper than that. Yeah. Yeah. And even older correct. people can be tricked by that. Mm -hmm. I would say that's absolutely right. And I would say that there's a fair bit of that going on. These, these views, because they're not tethered to the world and because there's no objective standards, they really do empower and and take the brakes off of the worst instincts of, of people yes they do they really do you allow know, the worst of us to come out yeah and now that we have that largely on social media where there are where there isn't any consequence to what people say mm -hmm. then they get away with saying those things and uh become even more apt to uh, speak up mm -hmm. and say things that they wouldn't even say in if they were standing next to you because they'd get punched. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was it? Mike Tyson said we've we've people have become oh, yeah, way too yeah. comfortable with saying things without getting punched in the mouth. Oh, yeah, that was yeah, pretty funny. Yeah. I, I that mean, was I really good. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not interested in solving things with fists, although I like to think I can hold my own. But but I do think. There's this, there's this sort of these twin curses of an, a, anonymity or these twin features. Sometimes anonymity can be useful for people who are genuinely oppressed. For example, if somebody is writing in the Soviet Union, it might be they might want to keep themselves anonymous to protect themselves from Stalin. Yeah. On the other hand, in a free society such as ours, which is still for the most part free, um, anonymity 
really does ramp up people's ability to say things without consequence at all. Well, that's where all the people who want to say things like that will go because, because they can. So this is, this is, I started out my account. I have, I think 128,000 followers now. I started my account out and my account was anonymous when I started. And it was anonymous because I expected it to just be like, I was going to just write a little bit about postmodernism and some other people are going to write about postmodernism. And I was looking for a job at the time. And I thought, you know, if I put my name on it, and someone sees me writing about postmodernism, they might just think I'm a weirdo. So I'll just have this little anonymous account. I'm allowed to have an account now because I had, I, when I was in government, I wasn't supposed to have any forward facing social media. And I thought, you know, um, a couple of my friends had said, um, after I'd left my job, I said, well, what should I do now? And they, we, we prayed and they said, Mm -hmm. we feel like you should start writing. And on the house that I had just purchased, written on one of the walls, unbeknownst to me, was the words, start writing, but W-R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G. And I thought, well, that's a kind of interesting coincidence. (laughs) What's the least Mm -hmm. I can do? Well, I can start a social media account and and I can tweet about postmodernism. So I did that anonymously. Mm -hmm. But once I hit about 10 or 12,000 followers, I thought to myself, I'm getting a little bit of influence. Mm -hmm. If I keep hiding myself, what happens if I let people see my face and I own my words, what happens? And I thought about this and I sat there and I said to myself, and this was back in, I believe August or maybe September of 2020. I said to myself, Hmm, if I'm on, if I'm on my deathbed, am I going to look back and say, Boy, glad I stayed anonymous. Or am I going to look back on and say, no, I wish I would have owned that. I wish I would have come out and just said, I I will be the one to take the bullets. And I'll put my face on it and I'll stand behind it. And hopefully, hopefully that means something. Because if I don't. And how did that change for you? Well, what it changed for me is I thought. If I stay anonymous and we lose, I will always wonder what happened, what would have happened had I come out and been myself and spoken for myself. Right. And I think I thought that when I started a podcast too, you know, before I started the podcast, I was traveling around with my husband. Mm -hmm. I was taking care of business, but I wasn't saying anything, you know? Yeah. And then I got sick and I actually prayed Mm -hmm. and I said, Um, if I get to live, I promise that I'll speak up. Mm -hmm. And so then I had to start a podcast Mm -hmm. and I had to start talking to people about whatever they want to talk about. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that the only way out of this is for each of us to, uh, try to find a, find a, moral compass and to move forward and do the next right thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Cause I thought if, if we lose and I, and I, and I didn't step out, I'll regret that. And then the second thing I yeah. thought is if we win and I didn't step out, I'm not going to get credit for it. <laughs> right. So, so either way, <laughs> either way, I, I'd better come out and say something. And so yeah. uh, Benjamin Boyce had me on his podcast for the very first time. I had a ter- mm-hmm. I had a a 780 or 720p camera and a cheap Walmart mm-hmm. microphone and mm-hmm. uh it the thing looks like it was filmed on a potato. But I did it. <laughs> and I I have a penchant for over talking and saying too much. I just had a, a conversation with uh, Paul Vanderclay and Jonathan Pajot, where I, I may have made the mistake. Oh, did you? Yes. I love oh, them both. Oh, that's fun. Oh, they were yeah, wonderful. Yeah, that's fun, eh? Yeah, I mm, love Jonathan. I bet. But I felt like I over-talked. I was like, no, I talked too much again. <laughs> but the option, the alternative for me... All you can do is practice. All nope. you can do is practice, though. But the alternative right? for me was hiding my face 
and and keeping quiet. And I thought I I can't do that. I yeah. I'm I I can't. And I have been lucky enough. I've been supported by Russ Vaught at the Center for Renewing America. Uh, I've been supported mm-hmm. by Chris Rufo. I've been supported by James mm-hmm. Lindsay. Um, uh, Michael mm-hmm. Fallon has has been. And I don't mean monetary support here. I mean just in terms of people who have really had my back when push comes to shove. Um, yeah. I do get I get I I do get paid by the Center for Renewing America. I'm a visiting fellow there. That's been really wonderful financial mm-hmm. support. And in the mm-hmm. battle against wokeness, um, there have been people who have come alongside who have really been super super helpful to me. And so the people who have really put forward um, and helped me either financially or uh, with with time uh, and advice on to how to discuss things or who have joined me in the battle, it's been. James Lindsay was there right from the start. Um, um, Michael Fallon has been there with me. Uh, um, Russ Vaught, Chris Rufo has been there. You know, there's a lot. I could go on and on and on and on about people who, who were brave before I was. And so I'm hoping, I, I thought, you know, either I'm going to put my name on this, take a risk and stand for something, or I'm going to hide. And yeah. I, at the end of the day, I'm, and I understand people who say, I'm not in a position, I can't afford to get fired. And it's kind of like, well, neither could I. I bought, I had bought a house in May and I didn't have a job when I came out. I had no money. Mm. And I could have lost my house. And I sat there and I thought, what do I care more about, losing my house or right. what kind of world my son grows up? Because if I have to give up my cell, my house to make sure my son grows up in a better world, that's an easy trade to make. I will gladly live in a tiny little apartment or <laughs> or a shelter and and ensure my son yeah. has a better world. So that's what I did. No kidding. You know, so yeah. it wasn't a hard choice Good decision. For me. So I was I was unemployed and and living off of of savings and heading on my way to bankruptcy when I made that choice. So. <laughs> Wow, and I'm I'm glad I did. I, I honestly, yeah, I, yeah. I, I I don't regret it for a second. At some point, I'm probably gonna. Well, I've been canceled a couple of times miniaturely. I had Rolling Stone did an article on me because they wanted to because I got ratioed badly because some of my tweets hit left wing political Twitter and and whatnot. And I've had some of that happen. And I'm sure that there will be more coming. Someone will try to cancel me for this view or that view or. Uh, somebody will make up a story or somebody will do something or they'll smear me or whatever tactics they use. Cause they always use those tactics. Your husband yeah. has seen all of them, all of the above yeah. with the false accusations and the smears and everything else. But at the end of the day, what kind of world am I creating for my son? So it's when, when, when Jordan does his, his bits on, on, he says, you know, we've got to quit being anonymous and come out and people say, but I can't afford to lose this. I can't afford to lose that. Can we afford to lose our society? We have to learn how to how to deal with being cancelled. And I think yeah. that George has learned how to be cancelled. He's learned that the the harder the cancel, mm-hmm. the better the rebound. Yes. If you're if you have done nothing wrong and you sit and you wait. Yep. And you gather people around you that you trust. Yes. And you don't apologize. It might take a couple of weeks of real tricky time and difficult time, but you wait and it'll turn around. Yes. That's- you know, there were times where he, where he did, he did really didn't think things were going to turn around, but, but they did. Yep. And I'm so glad. I have, I have one more question for you. Absolutely. So what, so can you discuss any current or upcoming projects that you're working on um, and what you're really interested in doing these days? Yes, but before that, I want to read a, a real quick quote from Foucault just so we can wrap things up. Someone says, you seem to have kept a distance from Marxism. And this is what Foucault says. He says, I often quote concepts, texts, and phrases from Marx, but without feeling obliged to add the authenticating label consisting of a footnote and a laudatory phrase that accompanies the quotation. Provided you do that, you're regarded as someone who knows and reveres Marx and will be suitably honored in so-called Marxist journals. But I quote Marx without saying I am, without quotation marks. And because people are unable to recognize Marx recognize Marx's texts, I'm considered to be someone who doesn't quote Marx. So although Foucault is not a Marxist, he's still picking up on a lot of that Marxist impulse 
a lot of mm-hmm. that ruthless criticism of everything, that unmasking of all that exists, he's picking up on that and he's making heavy use of it. But he's pushing it into a new formulation of power. So when people say, well, Marx believed this, Foucault believed this, the two can't possibly be related or influencing each other. Foucault says he's quoting Marx without labeling the quote. So just so we're clear about that. I want to get that Yes, in. right. Upcoming yes, projects. Um, mm-hmm. I'm working on a book, which I have a contract oh. for, and I'm hoping to release mm, that congratulations. sometime mm-hmm. next year. I'm, I, I thought it was done. And then this book came out, Cooperation and Social Justice by Joseph Heath. Yeah. And it is a fantastic critique of the current, what we might call the critical theories of social justice. And a lot of mm-hmm. those uh, ideas, it's brilliant. And it's also forced me to re- reconsider my defenses of liberalism to make them stronger. Okay. So Okay, good. So that's good. Uh, mm-hmm. What other projects do I have on the go? I'm I'm currently working on trying to fi- film a video series, which would be doing somewhat like what we're doing here, but in a more formal setting, mm-hmm. A, mm-hmm. eight or ten uh, lessons on what the develop intellectual development of wokeness, how it got into the world, yeah. its activist yeah. dimensions, how those activist mm-hmm. dimensions kind of moved along, and so that's that's kind of what I've got on the go. And I are you going to do that uh, in conversation with someone? Oh, I hope to do it as a class. A class. Yeah, I so see. I'm going to I'm going to set it up like a like a lecture series so I have a, an audience so I can read people oh, to see. see if they understand and then I'm going to film myself oh, doing that so it'll be like an online class but I'll be teaching it in front of people so that I have someone to react to so they can Does this person oh, understand? Yeah. Am I Good. being clear? What about yourself? Yeah, what yeah. are your guys' Good projects? Idea. Um Well, we were in this monastery and there was an artist there. And he was hired to paint Renaissance paintings, large Mm -hmm. Renaissance paintings, religious paintings, to go in the new chapel that they uh, built recently. And his teacher came to visit, and he was there at the same time as we were. Okay. Turned out he's a professor of a small atelier in Florence, Italy. He had been a student in, I think, Princeton, but I can't quite remember, in the 60s, -hmm. wasn't interested in modern art. So he went to Europe to see what he could find, and he found an old fellow, and now he's 74. But when he was a young young guy, he um, went there and he met someone who was well-versed in the style that artists used to do portraits, Hmm. Renaissance portraits. And he Hmm. said, if you follow me and learn from me, then this won't die. But if you don't follow me, then the whole enterprise of this uh, historical uh, way of of, uh, developing a painting is going to die with me. And so he stayed there and he is training people on how to draw and paint in a, in a uh, Renaissance style. And so I'm going to go there in September and take a course. So oh, that'll be very good. Wonderful. Yeah. That sounds like a yeah, lot well, of I fun. I went to art school. I've done, I've done art through my life, but I haven't okay. done it for a while. So this will be just exactly right. So that'll be good. So I'm going to go do that. Um, we're going to finish our tour okay. the end of May. Uh, in Canada by then, and then we're going to take five months where we aren't on tour. Good. Good. And so we'll see family. I think there'll be a number of different events we go to, but it won't be uh, book-related. Jordan's book is going to come out next January or so, and then we'll probably start touring again. (laughs) Tour, tour, tour. Always busy (laughs) with you guys, eh? You guys are always on the go. When... When we first went, the first year we went on tour, the the fellows we met, a lot of them, and they were mostly men, were really suffering. Mm -hmm. And you could see it and you could hear it in their stories because their stories were were rough. Yeah. And this time we're touring and, you know, most of the people are dressed in suits and they're coming with a partner and – there's sometimes they're coming with their families and uh, 
it's good. I love that. Actually. I love yeah, that. it's good. And so I think that, uh, and I hope, and Jordan hopes that all of the different places that we go, all the people we meet, all the people who come hoping to better themselves. And that's what they do. They take a night out of time and they come to listen to him mm -hmm. and to learn from him and to put it into action. And I know that people are starting to put it into action. We've been talking a lot about civic duty, the, the necessity for civic duty. You know, people say, what do we do about these gender problems in the schools? And, and uh, are you on the school board? Right. Who's on the school board? Who's making these decisions to teach these things to our children? Do you have anything to do with it? If you're concerned, it's your problem. That's right. It's your problem. That's right. You have to go do that. That's absolutely right. Yep. And it's a hard thing to recognize. Like, I don't want to be on any school board. Yeah, but you don't get to choose your problems. That's right. Your problems choose you. And so, you know, it. it and I think it's making a difference. It is. I really do. So when I was in that's why we're doing it. When I was in government, I can't tell you the number of guys who are just like, what are you guys doing tonight? I'm watching Jordan Peterson videos. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> we all, that's yeah. back. And that was back in 2016, 2016, 2017. Yeah, right. That bill 16, C16 thing. When he gave those speeches, everyone saw what he was doing. People were looking for more ideas from him and they found his lectures and people came for the pronouns, but stayed for the lectures. And I really believe yeah. that he has shifted the pillars of Western civilization. Mm, yeah. In well, a that's powerful what we way. Pray for. Yeah. That's what we're praying. And this next book that he's writing, it's coming out in January and it's going to be quite a book. It's, it's one long argument. This one, you know, the, 12 rules, each of the chapters yeah. what was an argument. This is one long argument. So oh, it'll good. be more like maps of meaning, okay. kind of, a, you know, a mix of 12 rules and maps of meaning. Yeah. It'll be. That's good. And so uh, it's very exciting. And he's 85% done writing it. So. Good for him. It's almost there. Man, that guy yeah. turned up. But I've been working on my book for probably two years now. And every time I, I, I think I got it, and it's like, oh, no, I got to get uh, this. And like, okay, now I got to go back. I got to go fix this. I got to fix this. I got to fix this. I got to fix this. That's what this book yeah, did to me. Yeah. That's what this book did to me. Um, <laughs> it's also a little bit what this book did to me. This is another fantastic. Um, Which, what's that one? This is What's that one? I couldn't see it. Cynical Theories. By cynical theories. Yeah. So instead of critical who's it theories, by? Uh, Helen Pluckrose Helen? and James Lindsay. Right. And uh, that that's an excellent book. I I haven't decided what to call mine. I was going to call it. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a couple of ones. It's going to be called um, "Breaking the Spell of the Postmodern World and Weaving a Rainbow of Meaning." Mm -hmm. The other one was going to be um, "Wokeopoly." I was going to thought about that, but I thought it was a bit of a silly <laughs> title. Um, yeah, that's kind of fun. Things You Can't Describe Your Way Out Of, which was suggested by a, f a friend of mine for his book, but he, he chose a different title. So I thought, well, I can take that one. Um, I, I, I can't, I, I haven't quite decided, but I, I, I am in awe at his ability to, 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 get, to get the things done and to get the books out so that people can read them. Yeah, well, he's got a good, you know, when I, he was a graduate student, he would get up in the morning and write for three hours every day. And we got married. We had little kids. He got up every morning, wrote for three hours every day. We were on holidays. Didn't matter what we were doing. He got up and he wrote for three hours every day that's, in the morning. That's impressive. And, and that, that, that practice, you know, and it's, and the thing is, you know, when we were really sick, we were gone from each other for two years. Hmm. We were so sick. Hmm. And, when we came back together, we were different, both of us, because hmm. we had learned life changing lessons, you know, through all of that. And we didn't know whether our marriage really could carry on or not. Turned out the things that we had practiced survived. Huh. He could still write. He could still write. I could still do yoga. Right. And I could pray. That's right. And we could dance because we had a practice of dancing, of having dates and dancing. Yeah. And those things survived. And so our marriage survived. 
it was, it was remarkable. That's that's there. There is that's um, oh what? There's an analogy forming in my mind. Give me a minute. It's kind of like <laughs> there comes a point when you're braiding something together, where the where the where you've got two strings or maybe three strings or three pieces of yarn, but you braid. And braid. Once the braid is finished, once you get along they're functionally become part of the same object, right? They become function part of the same mm. thing. And I feel like when yeah. you guys are married, as long as you are, and you have a deep abiding relationship, th the thing can survive change to the, to the individual parts without the thing itself breaking to pieces. Yeah, right. And I remember mm -hmm. distinctly seeing when when Jordan was probably – just after he had recovered, maybe just before COVID, maybe just after he recovered from COVID and he was first back in Canada and there, it was him just walking. And I don't remember what he was maybe pushing a lawnmower, maybe not, but he was just walking in a pair of jeans. And he said a couple of words, didn't say much, and you could see he was in a rough way. And I, I remember sitting and thinking to myself, okay, he got hooked on by benzodiazepines told his wife was going to die she didn't and he almost died of covid and 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 having worked in the addiction field a little bit i know what getting someone off of benzodiazepines like mm. that is a minor miracle Terrible. minor miracle in and of itself like it changes you man yeah. a lot of people can't do it or they don't do it correctly and don't realize that that's not a process you stop that's a process of slowly weaning off it and having withdrawal symptoms be extended for the full length of the weaning and then sometime afterwards. And it takes a long time because yeah. man, that stuff integrates itself into your, into your whole neurological system. Yeah. Well, it changes, it changes all of the um, delivery and uh, of hormones and everything. It's really, and I saw him just like anti Antidepressants also yeah. are the same thing. You know, you don't stop them all of a sudden either. You stop them super, super slow yeah. because your brain has changed. Yep. And I remember seeing him in that spot and I was like, if he ever comes back from this, the level of strength he's going to have to have been strong enough and the confidence that you have in, okay, the things that I have been suggesting have, have now been tested on me in my <laughs> in my in the in the period of my old age i'm not 27 anymore he's in his what right. <laughs> he's in his 60s now yeah and so i did that in my 60s in one of the most difficult situations having almost died and in a very weak state and the principles pulled me back and i was like if that works he's going to come back and he's going to be like the strength that he is going to have from that experience is going to just take him off like a rocket man. Cause people thought like Jordan Peterson had peaked. He was a fad. He was on his way down. And I'm like, he's still growing. His influence is still <laughs> extending. Yeah. Like those daily wires I've watched. All, I've watched all of the ones that have been released so far of his exodus. Mm -hmm. I'm just sitting here. I'm just like, this is beautiful. Mm. This is fantastic. Wasn't it beautiful? It was, it was, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was a glorious thing for me as a, as someone who grew up with this to watch Oz Guinness come back. Uh huh. Isn't that great to see him? He's oh, I did a podcast with him. Did it you? hasn't been. Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. So that's good. the first thing I did. Like last last when they first started Exodus, however many months ago, I interviewed Oz. Oh, he's wonderful. he's just. Uh, I'd ask a question and he would just lay out the answer. Yeah. <laughs> it was just beautiful. Oh, I love him. <laughs> I would love to talk yeah. to Oz Guinness because he's like. You could. You can. You can maybe. just ask him. I'll have to. I'll have to get. Oh, a, just ask him. I'll have to get his email from him. Oz. Can we talk? He's he's. I'll send you his email. Oh, he's brilliant. I'll introduce you guys. Oh, that if would you be, want. Yes, that would be wonderful. We, I love. Oz oh, Guinness. sure. I'll introduce. I you. love Oz Guinness. Yes, his work he's is, wonderful. Is, is really fantastic. Um, that that yeah. whole crew that they had brought in, uh, I thought because they had a bunch of they had a bunch of PhDs and professors, but I thought one of the people who made consistently excellent observations was Jonathan Peugeot. I was surprised no at his depth of understanding of scripture because you kind of think of him as an artist and symbolist, but his exegetical chops were 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 fantastic. I loved that. I was just George, like, oh man. George said he's one of the deepest religious thinkers he knows. Oh, I love yeah, Peugeot. He's really 
I love mm-hmm. Pajot. He is one of my favorite people. And he's infectious and contagious. Yeah. Oh. Have you read his brother's book, Matthew Pajot's book? No, I haven't. Oh, you might want to read that. I read it. And uh, it is, it's only 140 pages long. Mm-hmm. It's called The Language of Creation. Okay. And it's about the patterns of the Bible. So huh. it's, and he's a computer programmer, right? He's a mathematician. Mm-hmm. So it's very much a mathematician's book. The way he thinks is that way. So it's a very uh, logical book. Hmm. And and for talking about the Bible, that's really something. Yeah. You have to read about the first 50 pages of it before you get, you get the rhythm yeah. of what he's talking about. But uh, it's uh, he he self published it. He didn't put any footnotes in it or anything. He just wrote it. <laughs> but it, it but it's a master. Oh, it's I a masterpiece. That. I absolutely yeah. love that. I love it when people are just like, I'm just writing this. These are all the ideas in my head. Not gonna research that footnote. This is what's in my head. <laughs> Go. I I love that. People are like, no, you have to do three years. Oh, look, I am doing a book now. I have a big z- a gazillion hey, footnotes in it. But if you don't need that, you could just write. Go. So this has been fun. This has been fun. Oh, well, thank you. It's been fun for me as well. I've enjoyed it. So um, so is there anybody else we should talk about in postmodernism? Oh, I would say uh, Baudrillard. Okay. I don't know anything about Baudrillard. We should yeah. probably talk about him. We could. Yeah. That would have to be its own podcast, though, because that would be a bit long. Yeah. He's his own guy. But we could definitely have a conversation yep. about Baudrillard. We could do Baudrillard. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. I'm in. Round three, yeah. Should I read something? God, I hate to think. Maybe I could watch a YouTube video. <laughs> oh, he can be incomprehensible. Send me an email if you. Okay, I'll th- I'll see yeah. if I can think of something. But he can be in- pretty incomprehensible as well. But once you get him and you understand what he's doing, it becomes it becomes more readable. But he's, I'll I'll tease him this way. Whereas Foucault has an idea, and is I think it's this, and he then he argues for it. And Derrida also has a thesis that he's arguing for. It's like mm-hmm. Baudrillard is looking around at the, and they're both prescriptive or both both saying, this is how we think it is. They're both mm-hmm. saying, this is what's wrong. And this is what we should do. Like Foucault says, what's wrong is this. Uh, it's all power knowledge. The answer is activism. Derrida says the mistake is you have your bad old Western traditional metaphysics. The solution is deconstruction. And they're both, they're both thrilled with these developments. And, and, and Baudrillard is in a different scenario. Baudrillard is looking around at the world and he is actually quite despondent and pessimistic. He is in some way looking around at all the stuff that's going on at our postmodern world. And Baudrillard, because he shows up, I think he's a little, his kind of rise to prominence is a little bit later than Foucault and Derrida. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of looking around despondent at what's going on. And so his thing, whereas it's no wonder <laughs> by yeah. then he's got <laughs> with what he's been reading so far. Yeah. And so I anyway. think <laughs> that Baudrillard is more trying to reach for an explanation to explain something that hasn't been explained before. And I think Baudrillard is different from Foucault and Derrida and that Derrida and Foucault are arguing for a specific philosophies, whereas Baudrillard is looking for a way to explain what he sees going on in the sociological world. And in that sense, I think that there's a difference between Baudrillard and the other two. So okay, I'll try and well, let's find talk something. about it then. Yeah, that sounds okay. fun. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Sounds good. Thanks very much. Huh? All right. right. Thank you for having me. <laughs>